All right, hey, good afternoon. It's Dr. Norton here, down at Doheny Beach in Capistrano Beach, California, delivering our Christopher Marlowe lecture on Dr. Faustus. All right, so what about uh, Christopher Marlowe? He was born in 1564, he died in 1593. So 1564 to 1593. This guy was a contemporary of William Shakespeare's, but some, some serious differences in their upbringing. Um, Marlowe, first of all, was born in a place called Canterbury to a prosperous middle-class family. He went to Cambridge University on scholarship uh, to study theology, and he studied theology. He got his bachelor's degree in 1584 and a master's degree in 1587. He was there to, to hopefully train to join the clergy, but didn't end up doing that, actually. There was some controversy to the closing of his master's degree, actually. Um, as he was about to finish, they were going to deny him his master's because there was a rumor that he might have turned into a Roman Catholic. Well, this was a bit different than it is today, obviously. The, the Roman Catholic versus Protestant controversy was pretty heated. And this would be an interesting uh, bit of uh, a side research to do on your own if you wanted to Google that. Protestant versus Roman Catholicism in the Elizabethan era. Let me put it this way. Many people were losing their heads when they found out that they were Roman Catholics. When it was found out they were Roman Catholics. People would lose their heads for this kind of stuff. Um, now... During Marlowe's reign here, sorry, during Marlowe's life, it was Queen Elizabeth who was reigning. Queen Elizabeth was obviously a Protestant queen, but right before her, her sister, or her stepsister that is, Queen Mary was quote unquote called um, Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary because as a Roman Catholic, she was killing, she killed over 300 people because they were Protestants. Now, when Mary ruled, Mary ruled for five years before Elizabeth. Elizabeth came to power, and it swung back to the Protestants. And so Protestants were in power and Roman Catholics were kicked out. Um, it was believed that Roman Catholics would try to subvert the monarchy and therefore either kill the, kill the queen or the king in the power or just subvert the government and try to bring the, bring the Roman Catholic power back into the nation. Well, there's a lot more to it. I'm simplifying. But for our purposes here, uh, Marlowe was in trouble because of Roman Catholic sympathies. He was released from this and given an awarded, awarded his master's degree because the actual queen, Queen Elizabeth, and her privy council stepped in. They intervened on his behalf. Now, what's interesting about this, why would the queen care? Why would the queen really be involved at all? Well, another rumor about Christopher Marlowe was that he was involved in espionage work with the monarchy. He was a spy. Kind of cool. Um, just adding to the, to the intrigue behind this guy, Marlowe. Um, and so the Queen and her Privy Council write this in his defense. Christopher Marlowe has done Her Majesty good service and has been employed in matters touching the benefit of his country. The kind of service is not known with any real certainty, but like I said, there are some interesting theories that kind of run to the fact that, or, or lead to the fact that, or uh, allude to the fact that Marlowe was a spy uh, serving on behalf of the monarchy. So, all that to be said, he got his master's degree. Good for him and off to London to enter into the theater scene uh, with his uh, celebrated Cambridge theology degree. And we'll see actually in this play him put that to work in some ways. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of discover some ideas of how his theology training may have come into play in some ways here in this play. So Marlowe went to London. Reports suggest, and, and different kind of people wrote about Marlowe's life, it suggested he got into trouble with the law quite frequently. He was part of a rabble rouser. He wasn't afraid of what people thought. And he would often get into fights. He was seen as a uh, kind of a ruffian, I suppose. Um, but he wrote seven plays. None of them have real certain dates. Um, he was arrested in 1593 and accused of atheism. How about that? At one point in his life, accused of becoming a Roman Catholic and then and then here becoming an atheist. Well, he was released on bail. Before the charges could be pursued, he was stabbed and killed in a barroom brawl. Presumably, the brawl was started over a, a quarrel about the bill. Sylvan Barnett writes this interesting statement about Marlowe and about this play. The danger in reading the play is that we will see only either the heroic humanist or the fool. We may have difficulty in understanding that Faustus can be both. And that's really what this play is about is him either being a heroic humanist or him being just a human fool, just a very foolish man. And perhaps the truth is that he's a bit of both. All right, take a little break, take a look around.
beautiful day. And back to it. Some good questions to consider at the outset of reading. First one is, what is knowledge? Second one, where does knowledge come from? Is knowledge something we find or do we create it? Third one, what are, what are the uses of knowledge? What motivates research? These are very uh, key questions to ask even now, right? Nowadays. What ethical questions arise when we do various kinds of research? How do these questions haunt the characters in the play? And then, as I just alluded to, how do these questions haunt us today? How are they relevant to us today? All right, so, the play starts um, with chorus opening up our play. Let's take a look. Not marching in the fields of Trasimene, where Mars did mate the warlike Carthagens, nor sporting in the dalliance of love. In courts of kings where state is overturned, nor in the pomp of proud audacious deeds, intends our muse to vaunt his heavenly verse. Only this, gentles, we must now perform the form of Faustus's fortunes, good or bad. And now to patient judgments we appeal and speak for Faustus in his infancy. Now he is born of parents' base of stock in Germany, within a town called Rode. And riper years to Wittenberg he went. That's where he went to university, right? Whereas his kinsmen chiefly brought him up, so much he profits in divinity that shortly he was graced with doctor's name, excelling all and sweetly can dispute in the heavenly matters of theology, till swollen with cunning of a self-conceit his waxen wings did mount above his reach. And melting, heavens conspired his overthrow, for falling to a devilish exercise, and blooded now with learning's golden gifts, he surfeits upon cursed necromancy. Nothing so sweet as magic is to him, which he prefers before his chiefest bliss. And this the man that in his study sits. Now, I think there's something kind of interesting Oh, we might see someone coming up here. Something interesting in what, what's being said here by the chorus that refers to another story, we call this intertextuality, when another text is brought into this text. So another, another author, another, stories, another story is quoted in another text. So it's called intertextuality. So here we have this, this statement here. "'Tis swollen with cunning of a self-conceit, his waxen wings did mount above his reach." Who had waxen wings? What other story might that come from? Well, hopefully if we were in class together, you could jump up and say, Ovid's story. Ovid's story about Icarus and Daedalus. Train, car, train, train coming. All right. Interesting, huh? What's the story of Icarus and Daedalus? Well, Icarus is, is, is in a place where he cannot escape. He is imprisoned. His father, Daedalus, a uh, great craftsman, forms wings out of wax for his son to escape. But his warning is what? Don't fly too close to the sun, my, my young son. Don't fly too high, or your waxen wings will melt by the heat of the sun and you will fall. Well, it's a story about pride, obviously, right? Don't get, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't, uh, don't let your pride get you carried away, or else you'll find yourself falling. There's a, a statement in Scripture, pride comes before a fall. So that's kind of the, the idea that we, found, we find in, in the story of Icarus and Daedalus, or Daedalus and Icarus. But here we have it also from the chorus at the outset of Faustus, Dr. Faustus, and his waxen wings did mount above his reach. The play, uh, there's a conflict that's communicated here in the play. The heavens, it says, conspired his overthrow. The heavens conspired Faustus' overthrow. Now, how do they do that? Where do we see the, the heavens conspiring Faustus' overthrow? That's a question to be thinking about as you read. Faustus' first words in the play communicate, really, his great intellectual achievements. He knows all the sciences of mankind, and he wants something greater. Uh, line 75 of Act 1, Scene 1, provides kind of an interesting catalog of his desires. Let's take a look at that. He says, How am I glutted with conceit of this? Shall I make spirits fetch me what I please? 
resolve me of all ambiguities, perform what desperate enterprise I will. I'll have them fly to India for gold, ransack the ocean for orient pearl, and search all corners of the newfound world for pleasant fruits and princely delicacies. I'll have them read me strange philosophy and tell the secrets of all foreign kings. I'll have them wall all Germany with brass and make swift Rhine circles fair Wittenberg. I'll have them fill the public schools with silk, wherewith the students shall be bravely clad." Well, it's an interesting catalog of desires he, he gives here. Um, he lists these desires after a good angel and a bad angel appear to him, right? These two spirits appear to him. And these desires communicate something of Faustus and his level of understanding, I think. His desires seem, in some ways, simplistic, right? Are they, are they, is he blinded by greed? Does he desire nothing beyond the appetite of his flesh? These things trouble me as I read the, the beginning of this play. Um, these, these desires seem just so simple. He just wants treasure. He wants gold and luxury. I thought this guy was a smart guy. I thought he was a brilliant philosopher. I thought he would ask a, a question like King Solomon in the, in the Bible asks, that for wisdom, to know, to know all things, to know the deep mysteries of, of the universe. But no. Now this guy, instead, he wants treasure. He wants gold from the bottom of the ocean. This seems odd to me. We'll come back to that. But that's going to be a key thing. What, what is he desiring? What is he doing with this great power that he has? What is he doing with all the power in the world, really? And is this what you would do? I think that's a good question to ask. When we ask this of Shakespeare, is this plausible? What, what comes of this character? What, what, is, what, is, what do his um, actions show about his life? What do his actions show about who his character is? And is he a plausible, realistic character? Do you see yourself in this? And these are other questions I think are important. In some ways, I think we see him in some ways blinded by greed. And, and take a kind of a strange, twisted mentality earlier on, early on in the play. So let's take a look at um, Act 1, Scene 3. Here we have um, Act 1, Scene 3, line 25. Enter a devil. I charge thee to return and change thy shape. Thou art too ugly to attend on me. Go and return an old Franciscan friar. That holy shape becomes a devil best. Now, obviously, this is when... Uh, Mephistopheles appears to Faustus for the first time, and he's ugly. I, you know, I don't know. Once again, his first comment to Mephistopheles, this, this spirit that comes from the underworld, and Faustus' first statement is, dude, you're ugly. That, I don't get it. I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. This just seems odd to me. And, and this definitely communicates something about what Marlowe is trying to do with his character here. Who is this guy? He tells the devil to return as a friar. Uh, obviously, we have a, a Roman Catholic slam here, a little dig into to the Roman Catholic uh, community, perhaps. Uh, these were pretty popular in the Renaissance age. We see Shakespeare kind of playing around with this. Um, does this mean they hate Roman Catholics? No. Are they trying to get kind of some cheap laughter out of the stands? Probably more, more along that line. But there's people that have read into this and said that Marlowe and Shakespeare are very anti-Roman Catholic. Honestly, I don't buy it, but this really isn't the right form to kind of debate that or go into that. But you, you can kind of really read, read that yourself and then find out if you like that. Or, or I can email it, send it to you an email if you interested in that, in that debate. Um, again, this is more communication of Faustus's shallow desires, his simple physicality. That's kind of one of the things I, I find with, with Faustus. There's a simple physicality to this man. Why are these details included? What does Marlowe want his audience to understand about Faustus? How is Faustus different from Prospero? We just finished The Tempest. How are these guys very different, or are they? How are they different in their desires? Well, let's go on in that conversation with Mephistopheles, line 63, the uh, next page over for me, he says, well, he starts talking about Mephistopheles' uh, life, right? He says, um, was not that Lucifer an angel once? Mephistopheles, yes, Faustus, and most dearly loved of God. Faustus says, how comes it then that he is prince of devils? Now, remember, this is a guy with a master's degree at Cambridge, Marlowe, right? Christopher Marlowe. And he's creating a character who is a doctor of divinity. So, 
do you think that Faustus is just kind of playing dumb here? Faustus knows the Christology. He, he understands his theology of, that's not Christology, he understands his, his Bible. He knows about the fall of Satan and the fall of Lucifer. And here he is asking this question of Mephistopheles. Is he playing around? Is he playing dumb? Mephistopheles says, Oh, by aspiring pride and insolence, for which God threw him from the face of heaven. Faustus, and what are you that live with Lucifer? Mephistopheles says, Unhappy spirits that fell with Lucifer, conspired against our God with Lucifer, and are forever damned with Lucifer. Faustus, where are you damned? Mephistopheles, in hell. Faustus, how comes it then that thou art out of hell? And I love this. This line right here is very telling. He says this. Why, this is hell, nor am I out of it. Thinkest thou that I who saw the face of God and tasted the eternal joys of heaven am not tormented with 10,000 hells in being deprived of everlasting bliss? Oh, oh Faustus. It was mocks him right here. Faustus, leave these frivolous demands which strikes a terror to my fainting soul. What? What is Mephistopheles saying here? Mephistopheles is, is scolding Faustus for what simple desires. Right? Right there. Frivolous demands. Basically, he calls Faustus a fool. You're an idiot. Do you have any idea? He says to Faustus, do you have any idea what I gave up? Do you have any idea why I gave it up? I revolted against heaven, against God, for, 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 for a place, for God's place in the universe. I wanted all the power with Lucifer to rule all the universe, all the created universe. That's why I rebelled. I got a little luck. Lord bless these guys. So Mephistopheles is saying, I rebelled against God for something actually big, for something grand. And you want to rebel against God, basically, I mean, it's basically what he's saying, right? You want to rebel against God for what? Treasures of the ocean? You want to rebel against God for the best of hell? You're an idiot. That's kind of how it seems. And then Faustus doesn't seem to get it. Oh, what? Is great Mephistopheles so passionate for being deprived of the joys of heaven? Learn thou of Faustus' manly fortitude, and scorn those joys thou never shalt possess. Again, Faustus doesn't get it. Faustus sees only the physicality of things. He's sensual and physical in his nature. He does not understand the bigger picture. And Mephistopheles, ironically, is teaching him, or trying to teach him, instructing him, trying to instruct him in the ways of reality that he himself understands that God is bigger and beyond anything we can imagine. And Mephistopheles sees everything under heaven as being hell, which is fascinating. And here we have Faustus, the very beginning of this play, wanting to give his very soul up for what? For the phantasms, for the imaginary um, realities of, of a hell in truth. For the best that hell can offer, he's willing to sacrifice his soul. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible irony that, that Marlowe sets up for us. Not what we expect, I suppose. When we call this an irony, we're talking about something we don't expect. Right? We don't expect to hear from the mouth of, of the devil. Um, I wrote my notes here. It is presumed here that Satan or Lucifer and a third of the angels in heaven, is what it says in the scriptures, and a third of the angels of heaven rebel against God because they desire to rule in God's place. Their rebellion of a grand scale is contrasted with Faustus's rebellion, with Faustus's goofy desire for physical and material riches. Here we can see Faustus as a humanist hero, making the most of what he's got. What a humanist would be, I suppose. Making the most of a human situation. One who is willing to give all for the best the world has to offer. But here we may also see Faustus as a fool, one who gives up something of great value, his eternal salvation for the best of hell. here begins to work with Mephistopheles. We see here in Act 2, Scene 2, uh, line 18. Let's go there. Act 
to scene two, line 18. He says this. So Faustus and Mephistopheles are talking and they're arguing about um, realities and life and things of a divine nature or things of a supernatural nature. Uh, and then um, Mephistopheles leaves and enter in two angels. The good angel says, Faustus, repent yet. God will pity thee. The bad angel says, thou art a spirit. God cannot pity thee. Interesting kind of contrast. These good angels, this good angel and this bad angel show up a couple different times in the play to, to ask that question. It's not too late, the good angel says. The bad angel? Yeah, it is. Um, what are we to make of these two angels? In some ways, this is a, a theological question. Can you lose your salvation? Is there a point of no return? I'm not sure the play actually answers that question. Faustus says, Who buzzeth in my ear? I am a spirit. Be I a devil? Yet God may pity me. Yea, God will pity me if I repent. Interesting moment for Faustus. Just in Act 2, right? Bad angel. Aye, but Faustus never shall repent. Exit angels. And then Faustus says this interesting statement. My heart is hardened. I cannot repent. Scarce can I name salvation, faith or heaven. Swords, poisons, halters, and envenomed steel are laid before me to dispatch myself. And long ere this I should have done the deed, had not sweet pleasure conquered deep despair. That's an interesting statement. And that's a good question to be asking. What is, what, what is it that Faustus really wants? Ere long, I should have done the deed. I should have killed myself ere long, he says basically, right? Had not sweet pleasure conquered deep despair. You know, there's another way you can, you can read that, actually. You can read that as, I should have repented. I should have repented. That was the other way I could have gone. But instead, uh, instead of calming my deep despair with repentance, I'm going to calm my deep despair with what? With sweet pleasure. He goes on. Have I not made blind Homer sing to me of Alexander's love and Onian's death? And hath not he that built the walls of Thebes with ravishing sound of his melodious harp made music with my Mephistopheles? Why should I die then or basely despair? I am resolved. Faustus shall not repent. All right, so there's some interesting stuff here. In this section, we see Faustus wrestle with good and bad angels, right? Through Faustus's self-talk, we receive word that he has done some things with his demonic powers, right? We see he has um, used his demonic powers to conquer deep despair. Is this Faustus's goal? Faustus is a man, perhaps, of deep despair and thus he desires to find comfort. His sweet pleasures are listed here. I think it's kind of fascinating. He says, blind Homer is conjured up to sing to Faustus. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but Homer, you know of Homer probably, but Homer is the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? Both stories were part of an oral tradition long before they were written down. Homer was known as a great storyteller. They're one of the greatest singer storytellers the world has ever known. Uh, the greatest storyteller of all time, and his stories he always told orally. He sang them for great crowds, and he was a very celebrated uh, storyteller. And so that to hear Homer tell a story, to sing these tales, the Iliad and the Odyssey, was, it was one of the greatest things you could see. All right, so that was the first pleasure he, uh, that, uh, that uh, Faustus checked out. The other one was this Amphion, right? Uh, how does he put it here? He says... Um, and hath not he that built the walls of Thebes with ravishing sound of his melodious harp made music with my Mephistopheles? He who built the walls of Thebes. Now this, this is a reference to a guy named Amphion. Amphion is the next singer that Faustus refers to from Greek mythology. Amphion played such amazing music. This was a guy who was a great musician, such a good musician. He played with the lyre and he was a great singer too. The lyre is kind of like, um, like a string instrument. He played with the lyre and, and as he played, um, the, the music was so powerful that massive stones lifted and, and formed a wall around the city of Thebes because he could command great stones to move with his music. Pretty cool. So in this act, however, Marlowe builds some complexity, uh, some difficulties. Uh, on Act 2, Scene 2, Line 71, it gets a little, it gets a little complicated because... 
Um, Mephistopheles comes back, right? And, he, and, and Faustus has gotten some nice pleasures and such and things that he likes, but then he asks more questions. Get the blip, there's no one stealing anything out of my car. Um, he asks questions of Mephistopheles, and as he asks them, all of a sudden he gets to this point. And you saw this on line 71, act two, scene two. Faustus says, well, I am answered. Now tell me, who made the world? Awkward silence. Mephistopheles says, I will not. Sweet Mephistopheles, says Faustus. Tell me. Mephistopheles says, move me not. Don't force me, Faustus. Faustus is villain. Have I not bound thee to tell me anything? Mephistopheles says, I, that is not against our kingdom, that is. Thou art damned. Think thou of hell. Hmm. So here, Faustus is confronted with the realities of who he has made his deal with. He's made a deal with the devil. The devil can give him things of the earth. Or, as Mephistopheles sees the earth, hell. Anything outside of heaven would be considered hell, according to Mephistopheles. So think thou of hell. Think thou of anything earthen, anything physical. Beyond that, you cannot know it, nor can I tell it. Fascinating. So why is it significant the devil will not answer? Why do Lucifer and Beelzebub show up all of a sudden? These are other questions that arise in this act are, has Faustus received what he wanted? Is Faustus free? And is this important? I think it's fascinating that Beelzebub and, uh, and Lucifer show up here. They're all freaked out, right? And, uh, and it doesn't take much for Mephistopheles and Lucifer, uh, who is supposedly, obviously, the, the king of all the devils, right? And um, for Beelzebub to kind of get all wigged out, right? They, they know that, um, they know something Faustus doesn't know. That Faustus walks on a hairline, on, on a razor's edge between salvation and damnation. Now it's Mephistopheles' job to make sure, by fear, he keeps Faustus uh, thinking, at least, that he is not free to make decisions towards salvation. That he is not free to talk about or think about things of God. This is, he's made his deal with the devil, his damnation is secure, and salvation is out of the question. And again, interesting theological questions. Is this possible? Can you lose your salvation? Um, and what is the nature of, of Faustus' deal with the devil? How can this be read in a symbolic way? What, is, what, limits, what limits has Faustus um, put upon himself through this deal with the devil? All right, Act 3. The third act opens with a summary of action. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that or not, but right? the, the chorus gives us a summary of the action. Um, and in some ways, it, um, it, it picks up, it shows us a passage of time. Um, so let's look at the, the chorus's summary here, Act 3. Learned Faustus, to find the secrets of astronomy, graven in the book of Jove's high, Jove's high firmament, did mount up to scale Olympus's top, where, sitting in a chariot burning bright, drawn by the strength of yoked dragons' necks, he views the clouds and planets and the stars, the tropics, zones, and quarters of the sky, from the bright circle of the horned moon, even to the height of primum mobile and whirling round with his circumference within the concave compass of the pole, from east to west his dragons swiftly guide, and in eight days did bring him home again. Not long he stayed within his quiet house to rest his bones after his weary toil, but new exploits do hail him out again, and mounted then upon a dragon's back, that with his wings did part the subtle air, he now is gone to prove cosmography that measures coasts and kingdoms of the earth, and as I guess will arrive first at Rome to see the Pope and manner of his court, and take some part in, in Holy Peter's feast, the which this day is highly solemnized. Kind of interesting here. So, what is the Course telling us? Well, the Course talks about the fact that um, Faustus goes all around the world, right, and sees things from up in the sky, high up on Olympus, and different things in a, in a in an earthy way, but just sees the whole world and the way things are made, or the way things are operating. He can't see how things are made, because he can't see God, but he goes up to these high thrones in, in the universe. Um, in some ways, that kind of reminds me of uh, 
of the story of, of, the, of the temptation of Christ. When Christ is being tempted by Satan after he fasts in the wilderness, right? Christ fasts in the wilderness, then Satan comes to tempt him. And at one point, the devil takes Christ to the very, a very pinnacle, a very high point, overlooking all of the world. And he says, all this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. I don't know, interesting that Marlowe would kind of pull that, that reference or that, that kind of a reference in here to this text. So, Faustus is then taken to Rome, into the Pope's private chambers. Faustus and Mephistopheles are transformed in the likeness of cardinals. Um, they pronounce condemnation on Bruno. He has this a fictional character, not a real historical man. Um, it just basically will cause great problems for the Pope nationally or internationally. Um, Faustus has given him a robe that makes him invisible. I think that's fascinating, um, partly because we see that same robe appear in, in Harry Potter <laughs> many hundreds of years later. Perhaps a little uh, a little influence from uh, Marlowe, we don't know. But that's a question to be thinking about as we read these texts. Where do you see influence, especially as we read forward, right? Where do you see the influence of Shakespeare's Tempest, the Prospero, and where do you see the influence of Marlowe's Faustus in uh, this text, Harry Potter, which is coming up next. All right, so Act 4. Act 4 opens with another summary by the chorus. Again, filling in the details that lead up to Faustus being honored by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Faustus is interested in showing the emperor his own great power. Faustus conjures up Alexander the Great and his mistress Thais, the emperor is very impressed. Uh, he gives Faust high honors in Germany. While Faustus is gaining favor in the emperor's court, he is also gaining murderous enemies. I think this is an interesting twist. Why connect these two events? Why connect the fact that he has great honor with the emperor and yet at the same time, guys who want to chop his head off? And who do chop his head off, actually, right? Um, how does Marlowe make Faust's honor more complicated, more realistic, perhaps? Scenes four and five of this act involve Faustus pulling pranks on those who have wronged him. First one is Benvolio, right? Benvolio is the guy, and he rouses up a bunch of guys to come and try to kill Faustus because Faustus was, was rude to him and put horns on his head out of a trick. Um, and then the horse trader. I don't know how that started, but basically the horse trader comes and says, hey, I want your horse. Faustus says, all right, hey, just don't, don't take the horse into water. It kind of tricks him a little bit, you know, and so the, obviously the horse goes to water because he wants to drink and the horse turns into a pile of hay. And so the, the horse trader is ticked, Benvolio is tricked, they both try to kill Faustus, but Faustus tricks these guys, obviously. Um, and, and you know, something interesting about this, and, I, and I, my questions are this, does Faustus, does his power seem trivialized? I, I think it does. I think it seems trivial here. Why would Marlowe, here's a question, why would Marlowe allow his great ma great magician to be satisfied with simple trickery. Again, a big difference between Prospero and Faustus, right? Big difference. Um, Prospero is, is seeking redemption. Prospero is seeking to reconnect relationship and to redeem relationship. What is Faustus doing? He's like screwing around, right? He's just messing with these guys. Is this all this power is for? This seems goofy to me. But this is intentional, right? Marlowe is, is creating this on purpose. What, what, is his, what is his purpose here? Scene 7 involves Faustus with the Duke and Duchess of Van Holt. Now let's look at uh, uh, Act 4, Scene 7. I'll jump ahead a little bit. Act 4, Scene 7. Uh, line 1 starts with, Thanks, Master Doctor, for these pleasant sights, the Duke says nor know I how sufficiently to recompense your great deserts in erecting that enchanted castle in the air, the sight whereof so delighted me, as nothing in the world could please me more. The Duke says, hey, thanks for making that cool castle in the sky for us. <laughs> so he's alluding to something that Faustus must have done, right? Something he did in a prior scene or whatever we don't see in the text, but um, he makes an enchanted castle in the air for the Duke and the Duchess. Faustus says, yeah, no problem. And then he says, hey, Duchess, you're pregnant. Um, I've heard that pregnant ladies crave crazy foods. <laughs> That's hilarious. And the Duchess responds, oh, well, yes, yes, tis true, Master Doctor. 
And since I find you so kind, I will make known unto you what my heart desires to have. And were it now summer, as it is January, a dead time of winter, I would request no better meat than a dish of ripe grapes. Once again, odd, right? So we got Faustus making enchanted castles in the air for the Duke and Duchess. Um, for what end? Just to look cool and to, to win their favor and to be famous? I mean, is that, is that the end, all of his power and, and authority and, and this gift that he's been given? And then the Duchess, of all the things in the world, grapes. This is definitely absurd. Marlowe working with this idea of just absurdity, the absurdity of these requests, the absurdity of the rich, of the powerful, of those who have authority and who are drunk, quote unquote, drunk with their authority. They turn into absurd pictures of, of, of humanity. We have an absurd picture of humanity. Um, so we see Faustus using his power to impress others. Is this the highest purpose, the highest use of knowledge? Does Marlowe mock the human worship of reputation here? Is that what's going on? Is he mocking the human worship of reputation? Seems like that's some ways. At the end of this act, Faustus once again employs his power to mock fools and play jokes. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I find this play um, fascinating and, and deep on many levels. Um, I think there, this is a satire. A, a critique of, of, of playing with um, human foibles, human idiosyncrasies that Marlowe finds um, absurd, things that, he, that people love. And Marlowe says, this is an absurd desire that you have. Um, and, and the play, I think, is about that in a lot of ways. I wrote in my notes here, I, I can't really go into it with you too much, but there's a man named Juvenal, uh, a, Roman, um, a Roman writer. Uh, and Juvenal wrote a series of satires. Satire number 10 by juveniles called The Vanity of Human Wishes. This would be a cool paper if you're so inclined to write about Dr. Um, Faustus, but um, Juvenal's 10th satire is called The Vanity of Human Wishes, and he talks about the things people desire. And what do they actually get when they get those things? When you get money, what do you get? You get people that are trying to steal from you. You get people that are trying to, to rip you off. You get people that are trying to borrow. When you when you get beauty, so money is one. Beauty. When you get beauty, what do you get? You get people who want to manipulate you. You get people who only like you because you're beautiful. You get power. You get people that want to kill you when you have power. And so Juvenal goes through all these human desires, the human wishes. And he says, can't you see how foolish these things are that we desire? That the humankind, the humankind desires these things is foolish. And we don't think about it when we desire. We don't think about the desires we have very closely. We just think, oh, of course, I want more money. I want more beauty. I want more power. Of course, who wouldn't? And in fact, we don't think about what the cost would be. We don't think about what would come if we actually got those things that we were desiring. And the expense and the weight and the pressure that those would bring. Act 5. So this guy Wagner, uh, this is Marlowe's personal assistant, right? He begins the final act with a statement regarding Faustus' approach to death. So uh, Wagner, Wagner, basically plays the part of the chorus here. He fills in some of the detail, accounting for the passage of time, as the chorus has done throughout the play. Um, Wagner sets the scene for the audience, too. Faustus is at dinner with two scholars, two friends, two scholarly friends, and they request to see Helen of Troy. And Helen of Troy is the face, the most beautiful woman in history, they say, the face that launched a thousand ships. Helen of Troy um, was... Uh, she fell in love with a man named Paris and left her husband, a Greek man named Menelaus. She left, her, she left Menelaus to go back um, to Troy with this guy Paris, who's a pretty good-looking dude as well. And Menelaus was ticked, obviously. It feels like Troy, or it feels like Paris stole his wife. So Menelaus rounds up all the Greek armies and they, a thousand ships are launched to go fight against the city of Troy to get back Menelaus' wife, Helen. Because she's just that beautiful. Um, so these guys want to see Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ships. Let's take a look at line 28. Um, they say this interesting thing here. And I think, again, building on our the idea of, of some of the absurdity we see in the text. We see this, uh, 
Act 5, Scene 1, line 28. Was the, so Helen comes. Helen appears, right? He can get Mephistopheles to, to bring Helen. So Helen comes, and she passes over the stage, as the directions say. A second scholar says, and I wonder how he said this. It sounds like he would have said it in this way. Was this fair Helen? Whose admired worth made Greece with ten years' war afflict poor Troy? <laughs> I, mean, I don't think it was this. Was this fair Helen? Whose admired worth made Greece with ten years' wars afflict poor Troy? He's not. No, it, it, there's more of sarcasm. Was this fair Helen? Really? Is that it? I mean, she's pretty and all, but ten thousand, I mean, ten years and a thousand ships? I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. That's kind of what he says, right? Even the third scholar says, Too simple is my wit to tell her worth, whom all the world admires for majesty. The first scholar says, Now we have seen the pride of nature's work. We'll take our leaves. And for this blessed sight, happy and blessed be Faustus evermore. So, so what you see here is a similar kind of building upon this theme we have of the absurdity of human wishes. The vanity, if you will, of human wishes. That we say, this is the most beautiful woman in the world. She is worthy of our desire. She's worthy of all this sacrifice. Uh, in the story um, that Homer writes, uh, the Iliad, right? That's, that's about the, the wars between Greece and Troy for Helen of Troy. It is said that Helen is so beautiful, it's worth all these deaths. Well, here with the scholars, in one breath, basically say, I don't get it. You know, she's, I'm sure she's pretty, but a thousand ships? And all these deaths, all this fighting? Really? I'm missing something, the second scholar says. Surely I'm missing something. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to be able to see that she's worth all this. So once again, the idea of human desire, human wishes. Um, act one, uh, sorry, Act five, scene one, line thirty-six begins kind of a different deal. All of a sudden, we have a new character enter, um, the old man. And I wrote a question. Well, let's look. Let's, let's look at it first. Line thirty-six. Enter an old man. O oh, gentle Faustus, leave this damned art, this magic that will charm thy soul to hell, and quite bereave thee of salvation. Though thou hast now offended like a man, do not persevere in it like a devil. Yet, yet, thou hast an amiable soul. If sin by custom grow not into nature, then, Faustus, will repentance come too late. Then thou art banished from the sight of heaven. No mortal can express the pains of hell. It may be this my exhortation seems harsh and all unpleasant. Let it not. For gentle son, I speak it not in wrath or envy of thee, but in tender love and pity of thy future misery. And so have hope that this my kind rebuke, checking thy body, may amend thy soul. Mm. So, here we have the old man come to talk to Faustus. Um, why does Marlowe bring the message about souls through an old man? What kind of theology is in conflict here? Is grace for Faust, Faustus possible? Earlier in the play, Faustus remembers the thief on the cross whom Jesus saved, right? This was a man who lived his life in corruption and in denial of God, yet in his final moments of life, he is forgiven and redeemed. Is this possible for, for Faustus? Mephistopheles' reaction to Faustus' conversation with the old man is significant. Once again, Mephistopheles gets freaked out. Especially as Mephistopheles, again, like I said, shows real anxiety about the old man. Uh, he says something, something interesting here, right? Um, Faustus is, is freaked out because Mephistopheles gets freaked out, right? Whenever Mephistopheles gets, gets ticked, Faustus gets scared. And so that actually works pretty well. Mephistopheles can scare the hell into Faustus, if you will. Forgive the uh, colloquialism. But he says this. Faustus, in fear and trembling, I do repent, I err offended Lucifer. Sweet Mephistopheles, entreat thy Lord to pardon my unjust presumption 
and with my blood again I will confirm the former vow I made to Lucifer. Mephistopheles, do it then, Faustus, with unfeigned heart, lest greater dangers do attend thy drift. And then Faustus says this. He says, Torment, sweet friend, that base and aged man. Torment the old man. What, why is he, what, what's he got against the old man? Torment that base and aged man that durst dissuade me from thy Lucifer with greatest torment that our hell affords. Now, Vistopheles says an interesting thing here. He says, His faith is great. I cannot touch his soul. And then he goes on. But what I may afflict his body with, I will attempt, which is but little worth. Why is it of little worth? Because this old man has spent his life for the benefit and the improvement of his soul. Faustus, a weak man, has spent his life for the benefit of his body. The old man, the soul, Faustus, the body. And so we have body and soul, physical and spiritual in contrast here, in conflict. So, what does Faustus trade for his soul? Physical desire. Um, he says, actually, in the next statement here about, um, well, right after this, right? He says, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, whatever, please forgive me, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm Lucifer's, and so forth. And he says, but I'll tell you what, one thing, good servant, let me crave of thee to glut the longing of my heart's desire. I got, I got one more thing I really want. That I may have unto my paramour that heavenly Helen, which I saw of late, whose sweet embraces may extinguish clear those thoughts that do dissuade me from my vow and keep mine oath I made to Lucifer. He wants Helen as a lover, he says. Physical touch physical desire will drive away his deep despair. Ah, the train. Hello. Once again, we have, we have Faustus saying, what will drive away my deep despair? What will solve the problems of my soul and my mind and make me feel better? Simple sensual pleasure. Simple physical gratification will solve my deep despair. There's something deeply uh, troubling about what the values that Marlowe puts upon things. Is physical desire what Faustus needs? Um, actually, you know, if you look at this next part, in line 97, it says this, after Helen appears, um, and who knows, I mean, I don't know if it's assumed that they are supposed to have, be physically intimate, most likely, I think it's assumed that that Faustus and Helen somehow are physically intimate here. And, and Faustus says, Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Her lips suck forth my soul. See where it flies. Come, Helen, come. Give me my soul again. Here will I dwell, for heaven is in these lips, and all is dross that is not Helena. I will be Paris, and for love of thee, instead of Troy, shall Wittenberg be sacked, and I will combat with weak Menelaus, and wear thy colors on my plumed crest. Yea, I will wound Achilles in the heel, and then return to Helen for a kiss. And then return to Helen for a kiss. I just read that. Oh, thou art fairer than the evening's air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars. Brighter art thou than flaming Jupiter, when he appeared to hapless Semele more lovely than the monarch of the sky in wanton Arethusa's azure arms. And none but thou shall be my paramour. Well, that's what we see again. We see Marlowe dip into physical gratification, sensual gratification, to solve what? The deep longing in his soul, the despair in his soul. As we move on, oh, this, I meant to mention this here, I'm going to put my notes here. Francis, Faustus's reaction to Helen is one of a worshipful nature, so we see him really worshipping the flesh. Um, this is where we see him as quite the, the humanistic hero. A humanist would say, what is the best of what we have and how can I get it? Um, on the flip side, uh, in terms of kind of the metaphysical nature, what, what is not, 
what is, what is spiritual? What, what is there beyond the physical nature in this life? In that way, we see Faustus as quite the fool, right? Not looking beyond the physical, not seeing the possibilities of what could be beyond the physical. So why is Faust, Faustus refused salvation? Let's take a look at the end here. 5-2. Um, Act 5, scene 2, line 140. It says this. Now hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven, that time may cease and midnight never come. Fair nature's eyes, rise, rise again and make perpetual day, or let this hour be but a year, a month, a week, a natural day. Train crossing. Do you notice what Faust is doing here? Faustus is not praying, he is wishing upon a star. Actually, it's what he's doing here, to use a cliche. I wish that the heavens would stop moving. Because, again, his hope is what? His hope, he's placing all of his hope in the physicality of nature. All of his hope is rooted and based in the physicality of nature. Is that a proper place for his hope? That's one of the questions of the text. Is his hope properly placed in the physicality of nature, in, in natural um, space and time? What is necessary for Faustus's salvation? Why can he not be saved? That's a question that you should be asking yourself as you finish the text. What keeps him from salvation? What words must he say? What must he do to be saved? I think this is a question that must be asked at the end of this text. The, the, the text doesn't make it very clear. Uh, the chorus doesn't come in and say, Oh, Faustus, if you just would have followed that old man. Oh, Faustus, if you would have just gone after that good angel. It doesn't, it doesn't make it that simple. What could Faustus have done? Could he have done anything to be saved? And then let's read the final lines of this chorus. Cut is the branch that might have grown full straight, and burned is Apollo's laurel bough that sometime grew within this learned man. Faustus is gone. Regard his hellish fall, whose fiendish fortune may exhort the wise only to wonder at unlawful things, whose deepness doth entice such forward wits to practice more than heavenly power permits. Now, I find this an interesting closure, again, kind of building on some of the irony that I see in this text. Things are not as they seem, right? What is the true warning of the text? Is it not to, is it to warn against academic scholarship? Is that Faust's problem? Did he just study too much, read too many books? doesn't seem like it to me. What is Faustus's real problem? What is actually that, that which damns him? Is it Lucifer? Is it this demonic regime that comes and rips his soul to hell? Is that why he's damned? Or is there something else? There's a question here about the physical and the spiritual, the physical and the metaphysical. Is there something beyond this physical world that would require our devotion? They will require our attention for a healthy and good life. For us to embrace reality, must we look beyond the physical to something spiritual? The question from the opening, what is knowledge? Where does it come from? Is knowledge something we find or do we create it? What are its uses? What motivates research? What ethical questions arise when we do various forms of research? How do these questions haunt the characters in the play? How do they haunt you?